as I said earlier today, I mean, th this goes, this event happens because of the generosity of our sponsors. Uh, without that, we wouldn't have what, what you've all had the opportunity to see today. So I want to introduce Blue Coat, Blue Coat Systems. Um, they, again, one of our, our platinum sponsors. Blue Coat's a leading provider of web security and uh, WAN optimization solutions. They offer solutions that provide visibility, acceleration, and security all required to optimize and secure the flow of information to any user, any network, anytime, anywhere. So I want to introduce Grant Asplund, uh, Blue Coat Senior Technology Evangelist. Come on up, uh, tell us a little bit about Blue Coat. And again, Terrific. we are absolutely grateful. Thank you. All your Thank you very much. Thank Thanks. you. How's everybody doing? I got five minutes, and I just started my timer. Uh, so what's, uh, does everybody know the difference between uh, car salesman and a technology salesman? The car salesman knows when he's lying. Okay. So, look, five minutes, what am I going to do? I'm not, I don't think any of you have PO books with you. Um, so I just want to give you a brief overview of Blue Coat, who we are, and in the spirit of rich media, which I'm sure most of you, if not all of you know, today 51% of all content based on bandwidth is video. It's forecasted to be well over 90% in just the next couple of years. It will dominate uh, the internet over the course of the next uh, couple of years. And so I'll finish with a fun little video, hopefully, that you'll enjoy. Um, so very quickly, global company, $600 million in revenue, in excess of 15,000 customers. We're very proud of that. 97 of the Fortune 100, 88% of the global 500, DOD, uh, uh, really a, a great customer franchise. Thousands of partners all around the world. We actually protect using what we call Web Pulse. We have about 75 million users' web activity aggregated in the cloud. This gives us unprecedented visibility and the ability to actually track more than 1,500 known malware delivery networks. In fact, we discovered Malnets at the beginning of 2011. We're the only company that actually is dedicated to tracking them, watching them. And our belief is the best way to kill a tree is not to beat at the leaves, but to go to the root of the problem. And that's exactly what our technology does with WebPulse. We stop this malicious code at the source. We have nearly 200 patents, either secured or pending. And uh, we really strive to constantly innovate. And I really want to encourage all of you, pick up a Wall Street Journal tomorrow. Look through for the full page ad. We've got a very significant new uh, launch that will actually, uh, well, it actually took place today in New York. You'll all hear about it in the ensuing uh, days, weeks, months, and years. Uh, but hopefully you'll see that Blue Coat is elevated to a new plane and really excited about uh, uh, leading the marketplace with new capabilities and, and new technologies. So as I promised, I'm going to finish the last few minutes with a video. And I've shown this video a number of times. I think it's really terrific because what it does is it shows all of you why you really need a solution like blue coat. Now the message is when you're working, you need to pay attention. I know this is a little bit grainy, but it'll get better. But pay close attention. And when you get off work and you're on your leisure time, pay attention to what you're doing. And none of us should ever, ever, ever stop because cyber criminals are out there 24-7, 365. Oh, this, this is my wife going to Starbucks. Um, look, users are going to get tripped up. They're going to do foolish things. And you need to be diligent to protect yourself. And the fact is, for all of us, it's a balancing act, enabling the right access to the right content for the right users. And teach them to look for the warning signs. Teach them to look for the flashing lights, because they're out there. Now, 
Sometimes it's dumb luck your users are going to get missed. Other times they're not going to realize the cyber criminals are barreling down the tracks and they're going to be fortunate to get out of the way just in time. You know, users are going to crash and the cyber criminals are going to be right behind them. Watch where this guy's motorcycle hits the wall. Now, even practical jokes go bad. I would, I would say this one with truly impeccable timing. Now, even when you're following the rules, the cyber criminals aren't. So you have to watch out. And on the internet, out on the web, things are not always as they appear. So we need to be diligent and always on the lookout because they're after us. Now, it shows here the importance for multiple language support. This guy's got something to say to the driver in sign language. <laughs> Even when you're out on your personal time, recreational time, don't think that the cyber criminals aren't out there after you. They're there. And you have to watch out, because they're coming all the time. Users are going to try to outrun them, and they're going to trip up. And there's a lot of dangerous watering holes out on the internet. So teach your users to pay attention because it is dangerous. It's a slippery slope. And there's a lot of danger and we need to teach our users to be aware of it. Now this one really shows, even in what you could argue is the most catastrophic of, of accidents, if you have the very best technology, this shows you can still get up and walk away unscathed. This one, make sure your kids wear a backpack when they roller skate. That's all I can tell you on that one. Truly remarkable. And this one, you know, I always say, if this kid ever comes knocking on the door to take out my daughter, I'm going to slam the door in his face. But what he shows is he can still get up and walk away. So, so with that, I wanted to end with a little bit of fun. And... Uh, I want to thank you all very, very much. Many of you are customers. We greatly appreciate your business. If you're not, we'd love to have an opportunity to talk with you. And for those of you that are interested in getting a copy of the video, send me an email. I'm happy to share it with you. So with that, thank you all very much. <clears throat> Who's next? I'm next? I'm next. Well, I was going to bring it up for you. Which is it? It's nothing. I'm, I'm doing an intro. Oh, well, I'll put that one up then. I'll Terrific. This. Okay, can I have a mic? Oh, thank you. Uh, okay, folks, I am David Collins, and it's my pleasure to introduce our, our keynote this afternoon. Aaron Turner is a recognized expert in mobile security and information protection. He is currently the president of in IntegriCell, a mobile risk management consultancy. Prior to IntegriCell, Aaron was the co-founder and CEO of Affinity, a mobile security technology startup formed as the result of research conducted at the U.S. Department of Energy's Idaho National Laboratory, INL. While at INL, he collaborated with a team of information security experts to design the world's first large-scale testing effort to evaluate how critical infrastructure has become dependent on computer systems and the resulting vulnerabilities that these dependencies cause. Ladies and gentlemen, Ira, I'm uh, sorry, Aaron Turner. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Maybe I'm Ira Turner. All right, thank you. The, uh, my, my introduction always sounds so much uh, more uh, uh, sophisticated in the Queen's English there, so thank you very much. So um, my name is Aaron Turner. I'm going to walk you through a couple of things. When I was first invited to do this closing keynote, I, I thought I was just going to do a policy piece. And up until this morning, um, that was my, my focus. But uh, I, I sat through the, uh, the session with Howard Schmidt and, and basically said, you know what, I think you got enough of policy, so I'm going to kind of mix it up. And so I rewrote this talk a little bit, so excuse me if it's going to be a little bit rough, but we're going to try to make it work. And I've got 45 minutes to kind of uh, hopefully uh, blow your minds a little bit when it comes to both uh, the capabilities of mobile technologies that are out there, 
as well as maybe some different approaches that we can change the rules of the game. So the first part of this talk is going to be about you playing the role. And as I mentioned in the uh, BYOD panel, we're in Hollywood, so all of you are actors, right? You're all aspiring actors somehow. And so um, the, the role that I want you to play is an imagine that you are uh, a member of the Politburo, or you're uh, the member of an authoritarian regime. You go to work every day, and it is your goal to get as much information as possible to help promote the health of your economy, okay? You're, you're going to be sitting in this room as part of a big group of people, and our job is to capture and harvest as much information as possible. And so consider this as sort of primer on, on that in the first phase. Um, the second phase of this is going to be kind of a policy angle to make a change. Now, just a, a brief word from the sponsor who brought me here. Um, so I am an independent faculty member of a group called IONS. IONS Research is a group that's been working for over a decade to basically provide a forum to have objective conversations. Um, and uh, we've just started to put on an event here in the Los Angeles area. And so if your calendar is free, please mark uh, December 10th to December 11th of, of this year when we'll be out at the uh, Los Angeles Airport Marriott putting on a two-day event to delve deep into some of the interesting things around um, security. So um, quick uh, agenda here, and I apologize, I got my slides mixed up. So the quick agenda is we're going to do the primer on how to capture as much information as possible. That's going to be uh, followed up by a macroeconomic view of deleveraging the cyber conflict. So cyber conflict 101, mobile, right? This is the first session of, of an ongoing series of talks we're going to talk about as the portion of an authoritarian regime that is out to harvest as much data as possible. Um, you need to grow your economy so you don't have a revolution. Okay, that, that's the goal here. The bottom line macroeconomic principle is we're going to steal as much intellectual property as possible so that we can fuel our economy, build factories to make lots of stuff. Okay, um, and the traditional hacking has yielded okay results for us, but we think that there's more out there. And so we want to expand our horizons and go after mobile technology to benefit the great people of the fatherland. Okay, so everyone's bought into their role. So step one, understanding mobile network capabilities. Let's go into history mode here for a moment. Here in the United States, we had this law that was passed called CALEA, okay? And basically, it was a, a series of laws that stated what telecommunications systems and telecommunications providers must do in support of law enforcement. Um, the Communications Assistant Act for law enforcement was passed, and it required telephone operators to implement certain things like wiretapping. And another thing called trap and trace, which is basically looking at the caller ID going back and forth on phone calls. And other surveillance technologies for the benefit of law enforcement. And so what happened was, the, back in 1994, it was like uh, uh, Macaw Communications and the predecessor to uh, uh, Singular. And anyway, all the old school cellular companies basically had to scramble and go, wow, we've got to make it so that the, the police can do wiretaps on our networks and we can provide that. And so there was a huge push to rework all of the inner workings of the, 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 the infrastructure of these telecom providers so that, that cellular could be just as wiretappable as landline. So what happened was is the, those network operators went to the equipment vendors and said, hey, we've got to do this or we're not going to use you anymore. And so folks like Ericsson, Nokia Siemens, and those sort of folks, they went out and implemented tools in their platforms to make it so that you could automatically do a wiretap. And you could just say, anytime this phone number flows through our switch, record that voice call or store that SMS message or keep track of everyone that he or she calls. And those were all things that were built in automatically into the platform, were implemented since about the 1996 time frame and have been rolling forward to this time. Now, <clears throat> the important case in point that we as authoritarian regime uh, folks should have in mind is that there's a really good case study and it happened in Greece around the time of the 2004 Olympics. And what happened was is there was an Ericsson engineer who was working for Vodafone who decided to implement a root kit at the core switch level of the Vodafone network in Greece. Now, Vodafone is the one who holds all of the, uh, the CLEC or the interconnect capabilities of Greece. And so basically, regardless of anyone, any mobile phone carrier that we would use, it basically all flows back through Vodafone and then it flows out to the, the rest of the world. 
Well, so what was interesting here is that someone thought that there was going to be a lot of interesting communications going on in Greece around the time of the Olympics, because that's where all the presidents go for every country, and all of the CEOs of Coca-Cola, and all of the other brand name sponsors of the Olympics are all there. And so someone wanted to listen to all of the important phone calls going on. So they had this guy, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to butcher his name, Kostas Sakidis is the guy who was the network engineer who installed this rootkit in the Vodafone infrastructure. Well, he was found, uh, they, they think that he committed suicide, but in my opinion, it was assisted suicide. Um, and basically, someone wanted him to shut up about how he installed this rootkit, and now he's dead, okay? So from an authoritarian regime perspective, really good case study here. Take over the mobile network, kill the guy that does it for you, you're good to go. Okay, so someone had basically total capability to listen to every single phone call flowing through that network, every single SMS message that flowed through it, every single TCP IP connection that flowed through the Vodafone network in Greece. It went on for more than 18 months, this went on, before someone went, mm. And the way they discovered this was uh, they went to go patch the Ericsson switch, the patch failed, the switch could not be rebooted, and they had to lay a new image onto the switch, the core switch of the uh, Vodafone network, and that's when they discovered that basically the, the switch had been rooted at a kernel level. And so uh, take note, uh, authoritarian regime members, make sure you write your root, your root kit so that it can be patched, right, so that they don't detect it, all right? So um, <clears throat> the, uh, the fact here is that the base technology exists to, 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 to repurpose these Kalia capabilities to do bad things. And since we are in the great fatherland here where the carriers have to come to us and get licenses, we can tell the carrier to do what we want them to do. And so that means that we can make the carrier an extension of the fatherland. And anyone who comes and visits our network then we can basically infect them and we can, we can listen to their phone calls and do different things to them. And now, because all of the visitors who come to the fatherland are carrying these wonderful smart gadgets that are highly capable computing platforms, now we can start leveraging the capability on these devices so that we can become persistent on the device when they're in our fatherland. And when they go home, we can still remain persistent on their device. So we can push them malicious software while they're on our network here in our, our great fatherland. And when they go home, we can still monitor what's going through their device even when they leave. Okay? So, uh, so a as a result of, of this great uh, technology that exists, um, we can basically exploit vulnerabilities in the platform of the mobile infrastructure, the mobile devices that are connected to it, so that we can harvest information 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, so that we can grow the economy of the fatherland. Okay? So, any questions so far? All right, we'll go ahead and, and we'll, we'll take a little bit of time for questions in a minute. So, <clears throat> How do we avoid boiling the ocean, fellow fatherland participants of the great authoritarian regime? So we've got to target people who come in. We can't look at everybody, so we've got to look at interesting people who are coming. Um, <clears throat> we've got to find the most valuable people who are coming to our place. Um, we've got to attack those targets' phones while they're in our country and then become persistent on those devices when they leave. The, priority, the prioritization scheme that I would recommend us to follow is that we look for senior named executives who are in public filings of SEC documents. And if they come into our country, that we should target them. Because they most likely have some minions that report to them, and that lots of information flows through them. We should also make sure that we uh, gain access to as much information on their executive assistance phones and computers as well, because it's really the administrative assistants that make the world go round, not the executives themselves. So, we can dump their contact list when they're in our country. We can understand the social relationships that they have with other people. And that way, we can understand the networks that they work through. And by the way, inside of the Ericsson or Nokia Siemens or Huawei equipment that we're using for our great fatherland's uh, uh, telecommunications network, uh, we can build, there's a certain set of capabilities where we can automatically have the networking equipment build uh, uh, social networks for us. This was initially implemented to, to track 
RICO cases, uh, these are like in, in US uh, legal terms, it was uh, anti-racketeering stuff. So those things can be turned on in the platform to automatically build social networks for us to track who they're calling and then correlate that back to any address books that we steal from them. And so th I think that's the way that we prioritize this so that we don't, uh, we, aren't, we don't capture everyone who comes into the country. We start at the top and we dump their phones and then we work our way down. So now for a little bit of techie mumbo jumbo. So I'm going to go start speaking R2D2 for those of you who aren't too technical. So um, here is a graphic of the architecture of most smart devices. You can see here that underneath everything is called a bootloader. It's the, the piece of firmware that basically makes the operating system interact with the hardware. There is the firmware that then sticks up into the operating system and basically allows it to interact with the, the bootloader or the hardware itself. On the other side, you see this thing called the antenna stack. The antenna stack is this dirty secret that not very many people ever talk about, but it's a full-blown operating system unto itself. And then on top of the antenna stack, the carrier can push down different network-specific applications that can reside there. On the operating system side, we've got applications and data as well. So this is pretty much consistent with all smartphones today, iOS, Android, Windows Phone, and BlackBerry 10. So, Everything within that red box right there, operating system, firmware, network-specific applications, antenna stack, it is subject to total domination of the network operator, meaning that we can, we can have the network carrier in the fatherland shove anything we want through the carrier control channel down to those regions, okay? So if we want to make an operating system patch, we can make the phone think that it needs to receive an operating system patch before it can interact with the network. Um, if we want to go about making a change to the antenna stack so that any time a TCP IP packet is sent or received from the phone, it is actually routed back through our network, even when they're on another country's network, we can do that too, okay? So it's just a matter of us working with the carriers to make this happen. So within our country, within our, our wonderful fatherland here, we've got the GSM, UMTS, and HSDPA uh, system. Uh, this is uh, similar to what is called the, the AT&T and T-Mobile networks in the United States. Um, what's great about this is the switches have this scriptable capability where we can automatically detect what kind of device someone is using. We can query the billing information off of their home carrier to get their name and address. Um, we can get uh, full update capabilities, as I mentioned, where we can push uh, malicious software down to them. Uh, we can take arbitrary control of all voice and SMS communications at any time that are on our network, and if we install persistent malware, we can take con uh, control of those things uh, after the fact as well. But it doesn't end there. We can also work with the malicious software developers in our country. We can have them develop applications which can take over the back-end APIs to start shoving interesting things down into the pipes of the applications that reside on these phones, even after they leave our country. So if we, we get some enterprising young software developer to write this cool game called Happy Birds, we can trick people into installing them and then get access to their contacts list and we can start harvesting all of this stuff regardless of where they are and regardless of what network they're on. So we need to make sure that we go out and motivate our, our young citizens of the fatherland to write excellent malicious applications so that we can harvest as much data as possible. Um, the things that we can take advantage of is that there are many applications on these devices that have SQL injection vulnerabilities on the application. We can basically take over the back-end web service, send down a SQL injection command to the phone, and if that application has uh, uh, read capabilities to the contacts list, scrape off the contacts list. If the device is unpatched, we can send a SQL injection command down to the device, inject some uh, malicious software onto the device through our SQL injection command, and have the application jump outside of its sandbox and take over the application information that sits next to it. So we need to make sure that devices remain unpatched. We need to make sure that we make these applications as low cost as possible because the lower the cost of the app, the lower the quality of the code they're in. And so we can take over the peer applications as well. So basically what that means is that our victims are screwed. We can, we can go after their data and steal it all, okay? We will, we will have total domination over the mobile network. So in summary, as, as part of our goal of, of promoting the the benefit of the fatherland, instilling as much intellectual property as possible for the benefit of our economy. We know that mobile is a highly vulnerability technology. It's a high, highly vulnerable technology set. 
Uh, there are, there's lots of excellent information that's stored on these devices that we can harvest for both uh, identifying uh, individuals of interest and, and also identifying the information. So, and therefore, the more, con the more people that visit our country, the better. All right? So, before I move on to the policy piece, any questions about what we're going to go about doing to take over mobile technology to benefit the fatherland? Okay. Uh, let's take this first one. I can repeat it while we get going. Yeah. Just a quick question in terms of device wiping. So say once when you come back to the country and you wipe the device, does it actually wipe out the bad stuff? It depends, okay? So um, the, the best way to assure that you're getting rid of any nastiness you might have picked up is to do a full bootloader up uh, wipe. Okay. Unfortunately, to do that, you have to jailbreak the device or, or, or sideload it, right? And so to really fix the problem, you basically take the device out of warranty, which then makes you more vulnerable the next time, too. So it's kind of one of those things where it, it's hard to tell. Uh, our recommendation uh, is to, to make sure that you have uh, forensic images of the device before it goes. Goes, comes back, do the comparison. If it comes back weird, put it through the shredder. Any other questions about how we're going to use mobile technology to benefit the fatherland? Is this stunned silence, I guess, or people just... Okay. <laughs> um, okay, well, oh, one more back there. So what do we do when the users install antivirus and all this good security stuff on their devices? Okay, so, so really, um, antivirus on mobile devices today is kind of useless, okay? It's, it's, well, I, it's just as useful as it is in the real world. Signature-based blacklisting has really been proven to be an ineffective security control. Um, there are two uh, really good case, uh, case studies about just how ineffective it is. There's a group out there called Evasion, Evasion uh, makes a, a polymorphic jailbreak algorithm for iPhones. So basically, it defeats any jailbreak detection, right? And so really, um, if someone has installed some sort of signature-based antivirus on the phone, it's no worse than anything else. But you shouldn't perceive that as being something that's a positive security control at this point. One more. Okay, here and then over there. You said to shred the device after you come back. So do we shred our 3G enabled iPads too? So um, the, the, uh, the environmentalist in me will say, no, please don't shred those things. Make sure the batteries are removed and it's disposed of properly. Um, the security guy in me is like, look, there's, there's nothing that we know of today that will positively remove data from the flash memory on those devices because the flash memory controller acts like a rainbird sprinkler and it goes and it starts scattering data all over inside of, at the physical layer in the memory. And so it, it's hard to completely remove data from a device. Um, there's different things that CTIA has published around how to go about trying to make it more difficult to recover the data on mobile devices. Um, I think that those are interesting things. I don't consider them to be positive security controls or something that I would bet, the, bet my company on. For most people, yeah, if you just do a simple wipe, then you know, recycle the device. But for situations where you have a, a device that you know has been under the control of a malicious carrier, at that point, you know, don't, don't, don't pass that on to your local device you know, recycler. Just destroy it. Uh, so I know the um, antenna stack is something that's pushed out by the carrier. Um, as far as the firmware goes for the application device, if you compromise the bootloader, you're fine. You can obviously affect the firmware on the device. But short of attacking uh, a known exploit on the firmware for the device, doesn't uh, a vulnerability there really have to come from a vendor push, like uh, an Apple push update that requires user intervention, or an Android update um, from, again, from the vendor level, unless maybe you're dealing with a, a vulnerable application that has level access to that firmware? Good, good point to may, be made. There is, a lar there is a significant difference in the ecosystem. So iOS 
Um, the carrier can push down uh, antenna stack or radio stack updates pretty freely. Um, in our research, we haven't figured out how the carrier could push down a full operating system update yet. It is our theory that if you have an iOS image that is signed with an Apple developer cert, that you can push down the, f the you could push down that image without user intervention, without having something go bang or whistle or pop. We haven't proven that yet, so that's just theoretical right now. What's interesting is that Apple has partnered with the carriers where the carriers have gained access to certain certificates that they could use to sign iOS updates with. So for example, AT&T here in the United States has an Apple signed iOS deployment cert, which means that, that AT&T could push their updates down to the device. Um, and so if they've done that with AT&T, could they have done that with other people too? Maybe, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't have direct evidence, and so right now, iOS is in the realm of theory, okay? In the realm of Android, unfortunately the OEMs have done a horrible job in, in doing any sort of assurance around assuring the integrity of any software updates that are being pushed down to the device. And so in our testing, most uh, Android phones go, oh, you've got an Android update for me, woohoo. And so at the operating system layer, you can basically push stuff down at will. Because of that flexibility, we haven't gone after the, the firmware layer just because we've been able to successfully uh, sideload and, and inject malicious code into the operating system itself. Um, and so you know, I think at the theoretical level there for firmware on Android, um, I know of one, so HTC attempted to do certificate-based signing for their firmware updates that worked for about eight months until T-Mobile called them and told them to stop it, um, and they haven't since. And so uh, the Samsung Safe model has some additional protections for Samsung phones, um, but we haven't really tested the boundaries of that yet. So to be determined, we'll see. All right, for the sake of time, that's where we'll, those are the questions we'll do. We'll try to do some more the second half. So now let's switch into the policy mode here. So let's come out of our roles as members of the authoritarian regime, okay? And now we're going to be sentient human beings in our roles and responsibilities here in the real world. Now, <clears throat> because of what I just described to you, there really aren't any good technical controls to stop that. I mean, basically, once you enter malicious airspace and the carrier, if you, divide, if you decide to connect your phone to that malicious carrier, there's very few things that can be done. For some of our consulting customers, we're designing specific solutions to protect them and their senior executives in those situations. It's not cheap, it's not easy, but it can be done, okay? For the vast majority of folks, that's just not gonna happen from a cost perspective, from a motivation perspective. So how do we solve this from a bigger picture? What's the macroeconomic principles that we can start leveraging to maybe change the rules of this game? And so, um, and the reason why I want to change the rules of the game is because there are some people in the United States government who are throwing around this term called cyber war, and I think it's really, really bad policy. I think it's bad for everybody. I think it, it alienates, it dehumanizes, it's almost racial uh, in, its, in, in its imposition of certain paradigms. And so that's the reason why I'm delivering this talk is because I think we've got to change the rules of the game. So a little bit of historical background. If you were living in England between the years 1780 and 1850, and if you worked inside of one of these buildings or saw one of these water wheels, you were forbidden by the British government to ever leave the British Isles. And the reason why was because they wanted to protect all of their water mill technology. The water mill technology was what drove the Industrial Revolution. It, the water mill technology was the predecessor to the steam engine. All of this cool stuff basically derived from these things that you see in these pictures right here. And so this is not a new thing. Protecting intellectual property for the sake of economic benefit is something that's gone on for a long time. And so basically, we, we can start thinking about that of, uh, you know, what, what does that mean to us? So here's a great article that you need to read. Uh, do a Google search for Peter Andreas, February 1st of 2013. Piracy and fraud propelled the U.S. Industrial Revolution. Uh, I'll just briefly read this paragraph. Although typically glossed over in high school textbooks as a young and newly industrialized nation, the U.S. aggressively engaged in the kind of intellectual property theft it now insists other countries prohibit. In other words, the U.S. government's message to China and other nations today is, do as I say, not as I did. Okay? 200 years ago, my ancestors who were living over in England at the time were basically guilty of exfiltrating uh, intellectual property in the early 1800s over here to the United States. 
most of the thing that we think about as the US Industrial Revolution was a massive intellectual property theft from England, from Britain, to the United States. So this is not something new. It happens all the time. So let's talk about historical equivalencies. If you go do a Google search for Samuel Slater, you'll find his Wikipedia article, and he's called the father of the US Industrial Revolution. Well, as you start reading through that article, you realize that he was the largest source of intellectual property theft from Britain to the United States in the history of, of the world, okay? So when we take a look and we read Mandiant's APT1 report, and we find out about China PLA Unit 61398, okay, there's probably going to be a Wikipedia article in Chinese sometime in the next few years that's going to equivalent, that's basically making the PLA unit the equivalent of, of Samuel Slater, because that's essentially what they're doing. It's the same thing. Okay, so let's get beyond the racial intonations of, you know, oh, the Chinese are stealing all of our stuff and that sort of thing. Let's get beyond the political crap of trying to say that there's going to be cyber war and all that garbage. And the reason why I hate the word cyber war so much is because if the, the, the crazy people in Washington, D.C. decide to push forward with that, guess who's going to be on the front line of the cyber war? It's us, okay? I, I, am, I am in no mood to go to some sort of cyber war with, with a country that, that really we have no possibility of winning a cyber war against. So here's the political lunacy that I'm hearing. China's theft of US intellectual property is essentially an act of war. We are facing the threat of a new arena in warfare that could be every bit as destructive as 9-11. The three potential adversaries out there that are developing the greatest capabilities are Russia, China, Iran. We have to develop the ability to conduct counter operations against the country we know or anticipate. This is a load of garbage. It is a stinking load of crap. And this is what we're being sold by our political leaders today. And, and, I, and I despise it, because it puts us in the middle of a problem that we are not going to be able to solve. So, for, so from my perspective, I think we've got to change it. So how do we do it? Full disclosure, here's my idea. We need to create an ecosystem that rewards all parties to come clean. The US government is lying about the extent of the cyber problem. Victimized private enterprise is lying about the extent of the cyber problem. Nation state actors, China being one of them, but Russia and Iran and Brazil and France and Israel and Saudi Arabia. And I go down the list of lots of other countries of, of places that I have direct knowledge of them participating in, in theft of intellectual property. So I think that we've got to use the pieces on the table that we have technology licensing, tax law, and sovereign debt to try to create a solution here. Here's what it is. So <clears throat> let me, it, my formal education was in the law. Before, before I wised up and I discovered that I had a much greater per career potential in, in cybersecurity, I thought I wanted to be an attorney, so I went to law school. The first thing you do in any legal cases, you, in any civil legal cases, you have to establish damages, okay? So from my direct, interaction with victims of APT, and from my interaction with my colleagues who've helped clean up APT, I think that there's about $500 billion in research and development intellectual property that's been stolen over the last five to six years. Um, I think that that $500 billion is the cost of the research and development. I think there's about $1.5 trillion in damages that can be shown over the next three to five years in the value of that intellectual property moving forward. And that's a pretty low multiplier. So, so that's like hedge fund bank, like uh, uh, junk bond sort of uh, multiplier there, OK? So data points that I'll share with you. In one APT investigation in 2011, I witnessed the theft of $1 billion worth of R&D that was stolen from a company that was in the bottom quarter of the Fortune 500. In 2012, I witnessed another APT investigation where we saw $10 billion in intellectual property stolen from a company in the top quarter of the Fortune 500, okay? So those are the rough estimates of, of where I'm getting my data points from. So in the Fortune 500, I'm basically saying it's a, an average of a billion dollars per company that's been lost. So I've talked through this number with people in the intelligence community in international law enforcement, in my colleagues in the cyber community, and we're all nodding our heads at this. We think that this is a defensible number. So, so these are the damages that I'm starting with. So when you start to look at those kinds of numbers, when you start throwing around trillions of dollars, you've got to go looking at the balance sheet to figure out where things are at. And so where do we see those numbers? In the sovereign debt of the United States to China, right now China holds $1.25 trillion in US, security, uh, US Treasury securities. Um, 
When you look at the offshore profits of U.S. publicly held companies, there's $1.5 trillion in offshore profits that we will not see the tax benefit of. So what I think, it is, it's time to strike a grand bargain. And so we have to offer carrots for all. And the carrots are this. Mr. CEO of, of publicly traded company in the United States, if you tell us how much intellectual property the Chinese have stolen from you and document its value, we'll let you onshore one dollar of profit for every dollar of intellectual property you, you document, okay? So basically, if you come to us and say, yep, we had an APT problem and they stole two billion dollars worth of R&D, we'll give you a tax credit to say you can onshore two billion dollars worth of your profits that are currently offshore. We've gotta have a carrot for the US government. And the carrot is this, hey China, how about we just call bygones bygones, you forgive the US government debt in the amount of the tech transfer license that we're documenting with the private guys, and uh, we, we sign this technology transfer agreement where you pay some slight royalties moving forward on this technology. The motivation for China is this, and this is where it gets a little bit tricky. Hey, US folks, if you give me 25% of the future licensing deals for technologies that we discover others are stealing, like Russia, India, Brazil, and other, others, then we'll watch out for cyber attacks on your stuff moving forward. And so basically at that point, the Chinese would be motivated to be watching if the Russians are attacking their stuff because they have a vested economic interest to track down those cyber attacks and catch the people that are doing it because then we'll sign a technology transfer license and they'll get a piece of the action. Okay, so those are the three carrots that I, that I think can be waived. So let's make it real. Let's give you an example. Lockheed Martin, one of the victims of one of, probably one of the largest APT victims out there. They had such great stuff inside of the walls of their building that the Chinese went and attacked RSA, the security vendor, stole the seed material for the RSA crypto fobs, and then used that attack against Lockheed Martin, and did so for several months before things got fixed. Okay, so if you take a look at how much intellectual property Lockheed Martin lost in that, I think easily we could say $3 billion, and that's at the low side. So <clears throat> what I would suggest Lockheed Martin would do is that they come clean, and they say, well, we think we lost this stuff. Here's the amount of the technology that we lost, and here's the rough economic benefit. Now, Lockheed Martin has a $3 billion tax amnesty that they can basically onshore profits but you know what, Lockheed Martin isn't a foreign com company. They don't do a ton of business overseas. They don't have $3 billion in offshore profits. Well, what needs to happen then is that they can make that $3 billion tax amnesty transferable. They could sell it to somebody like Apple Computer that has $44 billion in offshore profits that currently are sitting offshore. They could sell that technology transfer, uh, the technology transfer benefit and tax amnesty to them. The US government documents the $3 billion in forgiven China debt to, to the United States. So basically, they take the Lockheed Martin paper, they go to the Chinese government and say, $3 billion, we know you got it, let's just forgive the US uh, treasuries that you hold of ours, and we're just gonna forgive that debt. China then goes on the lookout for people who are trying to steal Lockheed Martin IP. They discover that Russian groups stole the Lockheed Martin IP too. They notify Lockheed Martin. Lockheed Martin writes a technology transfer deal with the Russians. China gets $2.5 million out of the deal. Right. So, so that's the sort of ecosystem that I think that this could, could promote. Um, so these are, this is a huge idea, okay? This is something that, from, from, our, from my perspective when I wrote up this paper, and this is the first time I've talked about this publicly in this kind of setting. These are the kind of people that I'm sharing this with. I've shared this with a couple of, of senators. I've shared it with a couple of uh, US House representatives. I've shared it with the guy who drafted the security and exchange guidance around disclosure of material uh, cybersecurity breaches. Um, I'm, I'm trying to foment this among leaders of the cybersecurity community because I think this is the only way that we're gonna be able to move forward. I don't think we're gonna win a cyber war with China. They, they are way too well resourced. We don't have the discipline. We don't have the capability for, uh, for companies to be held accountable and honest right now. Case in point, I've been involved in uh, five major APT investigations over the last two years involving publicly traded companies. Do you think I own their stock? I don't. I do not own their stock because they have not come clean with their shareholders that they lost billions of dollars with intellectual property. That's the reason why I'm no longer engaged with those folks. I had a conversation with their general counsel and their board of directors and said, in the security exchange guidance, it states that you must make a, a disclosure that you've lost material intellectual property and they refused to make the disclosure. And I left. And so 
you're, we're basically in a situation right now where the market is completely blind to what these companies are doing. CEOs, boards of directors, general counsels, there is no motivation for them to come clean until it's too late. And let's take a look at the, at the, the poster child for how too late is too late, Nortel Networks. Nortel Networks was a thriving business, great networking technology, okay? Over the course of 10 years, foreign nation state attackers went and took all of their intellectual property and commercialized it in a way that basically drove it down to where it was zero. The value of Nortel's intellectual property by the time they went through bankruptcy and when they tried to sell their patent portfolio was pennies, if not fractions of pennies on the dollar. It was too late for Nortel. Nortel should have disclosed at the moment that it happened so that their shareholders could have known. Instead, their shareholders took a bath because they were not told about the APT problem inside of Nortel. So you start taking a look at all of the major victims that have gone across. All the folks who have lost billions of dollars of intellectual property. The ones who've disclosed it have tried to shrug their shoulders and move on. The vast majority of it is swept under the rug and it's the shareholders that are gonna take the beating. So, my proposal is, let's make it so that the, the boards of directors go, wow, if we disclose that we lost all this intellectual property, we can onshore all of these profits tax-free. Okay, that's, that's kind of a wash, right? At that point, the board of directors has a good message to the shareholders to say, yeah, we lost all this stuff, but we're gonna onshore all these profits so that we can do R&D some more so that we can take it forward, and we signed a technology transfer license so we still get royalties off of the technology that we transferred to the Chinese. Um, Government, can you imagine if Barack Obama came out and had a press conference today and said, the Chinese government has just forgiven all of the US debt? Can you imagine? I mean, that would be such a political coup for him. Because at that point, he'd have all of the, the far right wingers and everything that would go, wow, Barack Obama, Obama just like solved our Chinese debt problem, right? That, that is huge political windfall. For the Chinese, if this deal gets struck, they basically have a way to go to their populace and say, we have constructed an economically beneficial deal for everyone to keep our economy humming for the, for, for the foreseeable future. Because their greatest, the reason why they're stealing all this IP is because they have to keep their people busy. Because if the people aren't busy, they're gonna have a riot. And when people riot in China, lots of people died. Last time it happened, 30 million people died over the course of five years, right? And so you start taking a look at this, there's reasons why it needs to be done. I think it's geopolitically sensitive. Is it the right thing to say right now? I don't care. But I don't want to be involved in a cyber war. And that's, why, that's the reason why I put it together. So hopefully we see it gain more, more progress. So I've got five minutes left. So any questions before we, uh, we wrap it up? One question here. Your schema works Mike down front. Your, your schema works fine for commercial property, but for military and sensitive technology, that would require another change, which I don't foresee happening, and that would be to allow the transfer of sensitive technology. But it's already done. They already got Lockheed Martin's full portfolio. I mean, well, Lockheed claims they only got part of it. Well, I mean, sure, what are they going to say, right? I mean, <laughs> So, so I think all information is economically viable. They have it, right? Let's just realize the economic benefit off of it. And, and we've got this, I think, I agree with you that there's different classes, like, like you know, um, how to build a nuclear weapon is different than how to build an iPhone, right? There's, there's inherent differences there. But at the same time, there's, you, you can attribute it all back to economics, right? It's just, you need to attribute a different cost profile to that. So, I think it's not one size fits all, but if we keep going down the road of ma somehow magically Lockheed Martin kept one bit out and the other bit they didn't, eh, I don't know if I believe them. Good comment though. Co other? Right here? First, I, I think it's a brilliant idea just from the perspective of, you know, hey, we, we, gotta, we gotta think out of the box completely, totally. But then thinking out of the box, so here's my question. You're the CEO of a company. You got. $12 billion offshore you'd like to repatriate. You haven't had a cyber attack, right? So well, that you know you're about. Gonna go, well, you're going to go hire cyber attackers to ostensibly steal your intellectual property so you can get that money back. I we have created a whole new class of criminals this well, way. So, right? so I think right now, 
I think there's not one company who hasn't had a major problem, right? It's just that some companies are completely blind to others. And so I think in that case, in the most cynical of cases, which is what you're going down, right? The most cynical of cases is that they do go, that, that basically there's going to be a, a Chinese-based broker of information. And you go to them and you say, hey, do you know if any of this made it to your industrial complex? And they'll come back and they'll say, yes or no, OK? Well, let's say they always come back with yes, OK? And the technology transfer agreement gets signed. And the company gets the $12 billion benefit of onshoring their profits. What's the problem, right? CEO's happy. He just signed a technology transfer license deal. Everybody wins, right? Well, but they, but they can steal the information whenever they want, right? So I think, yeah, there are certain cynical implications that we'll have to work through, but yeah. So thanks for the comment. Good, good idea. One right here, and then, oh, we got one back there, and then we'll go here. Okay. Um, I like uh, some of the ideas that you mentioned. I think uh, uh, I'd like to uh, <laughs> support you if I can. Um, one question is, I think some of these problems are one-time occurrences, and once they're... Uh, once they're solved, I don't know if this model is sustainable. So, for example, if you wipe off the debt, well, what happens next? That's a one-time thing, and it's not going to be a recurring. So, I don't know if you've given any thought to uh, long-term sustainability of the. So maybe I didn't describe it properly. There's a technology transfer component where the company who transfers the technology gets a long-term royalty off of the future. So basically, when they sign the technology transfer deal, the, the, the debt forgiveness is just the, the prepayment, if you will, of the technology transfer. And then moving forward, the company enjoys royalties from a normal technology transfer license. So maybe. Sustainable? I don't know. Uh, we got one here and then one back there, and I think we're done for time. So right here. I think you answered part of my question. Um, it's do the numbers really weigh out on both sides? If for what they get as far as profits and intellectual property, we get a one-time payout. Now, true enough, we get royalties, but they're making gazillions in profits, and we're taking a small portion of that. Do the numbers really balance out on each side? So um, one of my really good friends is named Peter Cooper, and he is the head of investment for Incutel, which is the CIA's venture capital arm. He is a Wall Street banker, brilliant economist, economist guy. So um, he and I sat down and talked through this. And basically, the, the model that the Chinese economy has proven is that they are really, really good at mass producing stuff that's already invented. So, so basically, you, you take a design, you miniaturize it, you take it to a factory there, bang, bang, bang. All, lots of stuff coming out of the factory. Where Ch China has had problems is, is doing uh, unique research and development itself, right? meaning coming up with their own stuff. So, this model is such where we basically build a three to five year treadmill where the United States continues its innovation role in the world and, and uses those onshore profits to, to drive R&D. And then every three to five years, there's just a, a continual tech transfer that goes on. And at that point, it's kind of a treadmill, right? So it motivates us to make sure that we stay in the R&D position. It motivates the Chinese to go, hey, three to five year old technology, awesome. Put that into the factory. Let's go. Keep people busy. Let's, not avoid, let, let's avoid the revolution. So that was his perspective. Whether it plays out in the macroeconomic sense, I don't know. We're, we're in fantasy land, right? And we're in a happy place. So. But good question. Well, last one back there. Uh, it's a good concept, but what do you see in place for check and checks and balances to, to kind of keep that, any issues from arising in that kind of situation? I, mean, I could see China having taken a secret, turning around and selling it to Russia and saying, hey, they've got it. Where's our 25%? So even in the most cynical of situations, that's better than what's going on now. Because they're still selling it to the Russians. They're just not telling us about it. What, what do you see for checks and balances in, in your So I, I think, so I, I am a hardcore market-driven person, right? And I think that, that the market will figure it out. I don't, I don't pretend to have all the answers for the system right now. I, just as Stan mentioned up here, there's going to be abuses where people cynically abuse it to try to onshore profits or to sell it multiple times over and over again. But those things happen today. I, I'm not going to solve the market, right? So I think that having the ability to have disclosure is going to get us out of this goat rodeo of cyber war. That, that's basically what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to prevent cyber war. And, and so if we have abuses to the market, we have abuses to the market today. There's five companies that I know that haven't disclosed to their shareholders how much information they've lost. Is that gaming the system? Yes, because that company, if they were ethical, would disclose that they'd lost the intellectual property, and they haven't, so their stock price trades at X when it should trade at Y. So I think there's abuses in the system today that we don't have checks and balances for. So 
I'm out of time. Thank you. Do we have time for one last question? Yeah, so go ahead and repeat it. What's so what I'm simply saying is, is that I'm a thief. I rob your house of all its belongings. So now we cut a deal where I got to pay you back a royalty for, uh, for all the belongings already stole. Well, I already stole them, so I'm already sold them at the swap meet. But why do I have to pay you back anything? And I'm, I have the ability to just keep stealing, so why do I want to pay you? I, I can keep stealing. Yep, I think. That, that's, that, that's what I don't understand why the Chinese would do this. I don't, I don't the car that's the reason why I think we've got to have a carrot big enough for the Chinese to go, okay, we can continue to steal, because their, their, their cybersecurity and information warfare group, it, it is a drain on their system. Like they, they're dedicating resources to it that they could be dedicating elsewhere. And so basically what we're gonna try to do is make it cheaper for them to just get a license instead of having to pursue the, the theft, right? So basically you try to get a cost benefit analysis done where you make it easier enough for us to give it to them so they don't have to steal it. If we don't, if we don't solve that equation, then they, won't, then they won't say yes, right? So you're, you're right. If, if they think that it's easy, if, if we as cybersecurity professionals keep making it easier to steal the stuff, they're going to keep stealing it, and they won't sign the deal. So good, good comment. So thank you for your time and attention. Hopefully you've enjoyed this. Uh, yes, thank you, Aaron. We greatly appreciate it. And again, we'd like to offer you a certificate of appreciation. I got two. Awesome. Thank <laughs> you again. Mm -hmm. Yep. We made a donation to the Education Foundation in your name on behalf of your time. Thank All right. you. Thank you. Next, I would also like to introduce our second platinum vendor, and this is uh, Wombat Security Technologies, and Sandy's coming up now. Wombat Security is the first and only company to offer a complete suite of anti-phishing and security awareness products that leverage the progressive training techniques of professional educators to effectively improve the human response against cyber attacks, oh no, about 80%? 80%. That's amazing, that's great. Well. First off, so here is Sani Masoni, the account executive with Wombat. We look forward to hearing your remarks. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Actually, I think I'm mic'd, yeah. And I just found out I'm the last vendor before the cocktail break, so I'll keep it short. <laughs> um, and I really do only have one slide. If I can figure out how to use this. Oh, there we go. So um, the argument has been, can you really have an effective security awareness program? Can you teach someone how to look at an email and tell if it's good or bad? We're getting emails all day long. How do we know if they're good or bad? And our argument is, yes, you can teach them. People are trainable. You can change behavior. And if you were here for Ira's uh, keynote session at lunch, he talked a little bit about how to have that type of program. Um, and especially with the phishing attacks that are on the rise now. So back in 2008, the Army and the National Science Foundation funded a research study specifically on how to combat phishing attacks. How do we do that? Out of that research, our founders, who are professors still at Carnegie Mellon University, created Wombat Security. And what we have found is a methodology of assess and train, assess and train, is proving to be effective and it's proving to be measurable. So you can go back and show a return on investment from this type of program. Um, basically, you've probably heard of this, send a mock email phishing attack or a mock text messaging attack. Whoever clicks on that link, they get a quick teachable moment and then they can be assigned training from there. The other piece that our founders did, because they're educators, was applied learning science principles. So keep it short, under 10 minutes. Make it fun and make it interactive. Keep them engaged. And again, and then do assess and train throughout the year. Don't just do it one time a year. You've got to have a continuous program going. And again, in that way, we're seeing a real reduction in um, phishing attacks. And now we've applied it to a number of other threat vectors. So smartphone security is big right now. Social networks, if you're giving access to LinkedIn and Facebook, teaching people what to look for and how to use those types of tools. So that's what we do. If you'd like more information or more detail, both Casey and I will be at the cocktail hour, and you're welcome to ask us any questions. Thanks for your time. So for those of you who are not regular attendees of the ISSA monthly meetings, I'd like to remind you that we do meet monthly. 
and you're welcome to attend their lunch meetings on the third Wednesday of each month. And let's see here. That's right, follow Twitter. Also coming up next week, uh, OWASP is having our monthly meeting at the Semantic offices, so you might want to uh, attend that as well. There you go. Our, our community is huge. We've got lots of people and you should all join and speak to each other about the various things that make us secure. I'm looking for a slide that I don't see here. My apologies. One last attempt, and then I'll give up, but perhaps I'll get lucky. No, no, the, the video. It's gone. All right. So basically, we want to thank HIMSS also for their support at our healthcare summit. This is the first year we decided to have a healthcare summit. And uh, we had over 70 people in that room. So that was great. Stan Stahl also led our executive team, had a separate forum for that. So we are getting some vertical tracks for those of you with special interests. Um, we're all a village. Right, let's full, come full, full circle for where we started in the very beginning of today. All right, the message, we can't drive it home enough. Uh, Maria, make sure you know this gentleman next to you. Mike, meet Maria. Talk to each other, okay? Bring home the message. Engage people who aren't in IT security. Because, who, who was it Howard who said he's preaching to the choir? Yeah, this is great. We can all keep telling each other how great we are and how much we're doing to protect everyone else. But unless we engage the business side of life, we're not going to really make the strides we want to. I want to see thousands of people at these summits here. This is Los Angeles, huge. What's it, 18th largest economy in the world? We should have a couple thousand people at this summit. So can you all help us? You saw the size of the volunteers that we had, and that's the only way we could have the success that we have. So again, hats off to everyone who pitched in and made this a reality. Um, we're going to have a cocktail reception in another minute or two, right? But when you kick me off the stage, right? Those walls are going to magically come down, and drinks and food will be for the taking. You will have approximately a half hour last chance to get your cards in for the raffle drawings. Fifteen minutes. Okay, hurry up and drink, and then put your cards in there. By the look of the room, we've got an attrition rate of about 50%, so your odds are fantastic to win raffle prizes. So this could be a very good event. Besides learning so much about security, you'll also be uh, going home with some specials. That's right. The bingo card, there's a grand prize drawing, iPad 4. So make sure you get the signature from every vendor. You've got 15 minutes. Hurry up. Next year, we've already got this hotel reserved. The 15th and 16th of May, put it on your calendars, and we hope to see you back here, all right? Uh, there's no time like the present for thinking about a potential speaking engagement. If, you're, if you have something you really want to share, it's kind of early, of course, but you know, we're always looking for great speakers. If you go, I mean, think about how some of the speakers got here today. I went to RSA, I saw a great speaker, I asked them to join us. So when you see speakers, get their contact info, become part of the village with us, right? Share with us and, and let us know. So again, mark this date down. That's not going to change. Who are we? We're ISSA, all together. We're ISSA. But that's all of us. <laughs> <laughs>